Okay. Here we are. Um, thanks for coming. Nice to see you. Um, I'll just dive in. Um, so, by way of introduction, to kind of set the scene, um, one of my favourite uh, lines from Roberto Sagioli, the guy who invented psychosynthesis, he says, when will and imagination come into conflict, imagination wins. When will and imagination come into conflict, imagination wins. So what he means by that is that imagination is like a precursor to action. So if you can't picture something, if you can't imagine it, if you can't conceive of it in imagination, it's probably not going to happen. So you might have good ideas, but unless you can really imagine that happening, it won't come to fruition. And that seems related, I thought we'd start on a downer, so seems seems related to a curious observation that, speaking for myself anyway, it seems easier to imagine some kind of horrible, dystopian, societal, ecological collapse than it does to imagine a transition into a, a, a sane, sustainable future. Um, and Hollywood would agree with me because they put lots of money into feeding these dystopian fantasies. There's lots of disaster movies, and I love disaster movies. I was trying to come up with a list of like positive transition type movies and I came up with um, It's a Wonderful Life and then I kind of got stuck um, so if you think about them we could make a list at the end maybe um, but if this is the case if it's easier to imagine a dystopian end of the world than otherwise what is going on? How did it come to be normal that human beings are unable to imagine a better world. And how might we turn that around? How might we get our imagination back again? Because at the same time that we have an ecological crisis, we have an economic crisis, mental health crisis, we have a crisis of imagination. And it's kind of like well, what I'm going to propose is that all these other crises are making the crisis of imagination worse. And then because our imagination is in crisis, that means it's much harder to improve all the other crises. And we're in this kind of horrible, I told you it'd be dark, spiral. Because um, the problems in the world seem to, and this is what I'm going to present, um, impact and take away from our imagination, but we need our imagination to deal with those problems. So, um, the French essayist Annie Le Brun writes, she puts it quite well, the assault by the modern world on dream and imagination is a calamity that while seemingly minor in appearance is in fact the greatest problem of all because it makes possible all the other devastations threatening our world today. So it's kind of like within and through all these other crises is a crisis of imagination. And then alongside these global crises we have of course our personal crises. Um, the crisis of mental health, the midlife crisis, the crisis of meaning, the existential crisis, the crisis of faith, where you can't quite imagine life carrying on as it used to, but you can't quite imagine doing it differently, and you're kind of stuck in this hiatus, um, which can be quite difficult. And that might be how you rock up 
and go to therapy. It might even be why you come here and train to be a therapist, and that's kind of why I came here. And one of the hopes uh, and expectations that I had when I came to train here at the Psychosynthesis Trust was that it might help with the recovery of my imagination because at that time, 15 years ago, um, it was like the surface images of life, you know, like a cat sitting on a fence, um, a rainbow, um, they were becoming like, um, well I didn't have a smartphone at the time, but they were becoming like, you know like you just scroll past on a smartphone and it's just more and more stuff and it's behind a screen and it doesn't really touch you, it doesn't really impinge on you, it doesn't really matter, the way you just, it's just another image and it's trapped behind the screen, it's separate from me. That's what life was becoming like which seemed to me like a loss of imagination. And it wasn't just me, the friends that I had at the time seemed to recognise a similar thing. We were all becoming a bit more distracted, fragmented, ever less absorbed and able to focus. Just not really feeling there anymore. So obviously I was depressed. Um, maybe I was just getting older, maybe that's just what happens when you get older, it's just life gets a bit shittier. And it's just like a slow decline from the enchantment of childhood when you used to chat with imaginary friends. Perhaps it's because we've got all these technologies that are making us alienated and addicted and abstracted all the time. Um, but for whatever the reason, I didn't want to accept this situation. I wanted to do something about my lost imagination. I wanted to at least avert any further decline and I wanted it back again if I could. So I came along to psychosynthesis and I thought psychosynthesis would be really good for this because psychosynthesis of all the different therapy schools um, has an important place for imagination. It treats it as a psychological function of equal importance to feelings, thinking, sensation. Um, it's got a plethora of uh, techniques and approaches that utilise imagination, um, story, dream. And we did spend a lot of time using these techniques, but unfortunately not a lot was said about the actual business of being imaginative. We used imagination, we tried to figure out what images meant, but we kind of took it for granted. What mattered most was what happened next. We, used to th we, we thought about the images. It was about what the images meant for us. And that's interesting, and I'm not saying that's wrong, it's useful, but it left me with a bunch of questions. So these are the questions that we're gonna get into this evening. Um, what is imagination anyway? Because while psychosynthesis talks about imagination, it doesn't actually tell you what it is. It tells you how to use it, and it's important, but it doesn't say what it is. So what is it that happens when we imagine? And what might help us be more imaginative, and what might it be that's getting in the way of being imaginative? And why does it feel good to imagine? Why would we want to imagine? So hopefully by the end of the evening, we're going to have some answers to these questions, but before we get into all that, um, a story might be a good place to start a talk on imagination. Um, that's a story I've told many times, so if you've heard it before, apologies. Um, it's a story about my first day at the Psychosynthesis Trust, um, because even on that first day, some of the questions that we're exploring, this is kind of where it all began. Um, so they were starting to take shape in my mind. So it was a late summer morning in a shabby converted office building next to London Bridge Railway Station. And the teacher, she literally had red tartan Scottish like trousers on and a thick Glaswegian accent. And um, she turns 
from her flip chart and she said to us, okay, let's make a start with our first experiential exercise. Make yourself comfortable, put your feet on the floor, back straight, and then when you're ready, close your eyes. Okay? So everyone sort of shuffled around, bags, coughs, sniffs, and eventually the room became quiet. And we could hear the extractor fans and the buses outside. And I closed my eyes, and the teacher continued. Okay, good. So close your eyes, go inside, and find yourself in a meadow. So already we were beginning our initiation into the mysteries of imagination, I'm thinking, and I'm getting excited. Like, this is good, this is why I've come. And the idea, I didn't quite understand at the time, but the idea is that you turn inwards and you focus on the images passing through your mind and you find yourself somehow in the landscape of a meadow, in imagination. Could be a, it doesn't need to be a meadow, it could be another landscape. So what we are doing there is a, a deliberate recreation of that um, half asleep, half awake state of consciousness that sometimes happens spontaneously when you're waking up in the morning and you're lying in your bed and you're still dreaming, but in part you know that you're in your bed. So you sort of one foot in the dream world, but one foot in the waking world. And that's what I call a waking dream, but it's also known as a guided imagery or active imagination. But it doesn't matter. It could be any, any of the popular therapeutic techniques that apply imagination. The same principles apply. They all apply this uh, waking dream state. So like play therapy, art therapy, psychodrama, gestalt, empty chair work, they all, they're all similar to this. And the same issues and questions arise. It's about how to perceive and interact with images. So the trainer, she says, tune into the images passing through your mind. And it wasn't easy. It was all a bit of a blur. And she says, allow the details of the meadow to appear. So I tried to focus on these meadow-esque images to make them stand still. And she says, notice the details, the sunlight, the breeze. And I'm, and I'm like, muddy fields, windy field, rainy Scottish field. Wasn't easy. And the first thing that went wrong was that quite early on, I kind of went off on a tangent. And I was kind of like, inside, close your eyes, go inside. Where is this inside? Is imagination inside me? Where about inside me? And how can I get there? Because that's the assumption, right? The assumption is one of our inner imagination. Um, but I was very much aware of sitting in the classroom, listening to the buses and the extractor fan. So I ended up thinking quite a lot, which was rather a massive distraction. But that brings us to our first point, which is this. Um, it's not enough just to have experiential exposure to imagination. It's not enough to just be imaginative, uh, although that's important. And we're going to do some of that tonight. You also need to clear out a conceptual space that validates that imaginative experience. Our ideas matter. And they matter because how we think about imagination, our assumptions about imagination, directly shape our experience of it. So James Hillman, I'm going to reference him a few times, he, he's a, a young Indian therapist. He says, our approach to the imaging is predetermined by our idea of it. So I've, I'm, I've been given this idea that imagination is somehow inside me, and that's shaping and I'm going to suggest you limiting my, my experience. And while there's lots of like, workshops and books and videos and 
articles on experiential techniques that use imagination, not many of them talk about um, the philosophical assumptions that they have about what imagination is. Mary Watkins, another Jungian person, she says, it is ironic that those psychologies which seem to give the greatest respect to the imaginal have not inquired into the subject of what they have imagined of imagining. So it's like, what have we imagined of imagining? So, so again, what exactly is imagination? What's going on when we imagine? How can we imagine more fully? These are like really important questions, not just abstract academic questions, but we need to have answers to these questions if we want to have a more imaginative life. So, let's have a look in the dictionary. Perhaps we might find an answer in the dictionary. So the dictionary says, so I kind of collated three or four dictionary definitions together. This is what imagination is, according to the dictionary. That part of the mind that imagines things. The ability to form images in the mind of external objects not present to the senses. So what we imagine are images in the minds of people, places, things that are not present to the senses. In other words, images aren't the real thing because that's sense experience. They're a representation of the real thing. And imagination is in the mind. So it's a psychological interiority. It's a subjective experience. Hence the coinage inner imagination. Sometimes maybe it leaks out and we project this inner imagining onto the world. Such as a child imagines the loneliness of a tiny fish or a poet describes a cloud as a majestic angel. But that shouldn't go too far. That's fine if you're being creative. Um, but really it's only in imagination. And our loneliness that we've projected onto the fish doesn't mean that the fish is actually lonely. And the cloud, obviously a cloud's not an angel, a cloud's a cloud. It's just humidity. It's the objective and factual evidence of our senses that is not an imagined world, that's the real world. So, in this inner imagination definition, there's a few problems. And one of them is that the validity of your imagining is dependent on if it aligns with this like real world stuff. So if what you imagine doesn't match up with physical, observable facts, truth, science, then it's, uh, it's an invalid imagining. It's not to be trusted. It's imaginary. <coughs> It's made up. It's unreal. So there's this big division between um, the real and the unreal. And there's this like, assumption of being able to neatly divide the world into inner and outer and be easily t able to distinguish between the inner and outer. But if you're a psychotherapist and you're using the imagination, you run into a few problems with this, three problems. So problem number one, it pushes the therapist to eradicating wonky images, to eradicating invalid images. Um, so it's the idea that you need to find out these wonky projections and get the client to withdraw them from the world so that they can see things more clearly as they actually are. That presupposes, of course, that the therapist has the valid imagination, uh, has some kind of monopoly on what correct imagining is. Um, and then that, that sort of suggests that therapy is just a sort of conversion course where you learn to imagine like your therapist. But probably most therapists wouldn't like to think of themselves as doing that. Um, that's not really what we do as therapists. As therapists, we, we really value people's experience regardless of whether or not it lines up with anything else. Second problem with the inner imagination uh, assumption 
Um, it's kind of like a suspicious... Um, it's a suspicious definition. It's essentially a pejorative definition. definition. Um, it's like trying to figure out if images are, are real or not. And that distracts us from what happens when imagination goes well. It distracts us. It doesn't attend to, it doesn't even conceive of a positive imagination, a healing imagination, a, 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 an enlivening imagination. Um, and again, most therapists would probably consider that imaginative absorption and reverie are states of well-being and wholeness, and they are an important antidote to the distraction, fragmentation, and alienation of modern life. So the question it begs is, need we dismiss such imaginative experiences as illusory might they not just be fantastical delusions? And how might we clarify the difference between fantastical delusions and psychotic episodes and imagining? Third problem, and this is my favourite one, is that the inner imagination assumption uh, blinkers us from the activity of images in our everyday life. Because if you assume that images are somehow personal and inside you and subjective, um, as if imagination is like a container that you sort of stuff stuff in, then it, you're not going to be looking for it in your, in your daily life, in your relationships, in your sense of belonging, etc., etc. Um, But again, surely that's not what we aim for in contemporary therapeutic practice, because we want to have what goes on in the consulting room leak over into people's everyday lives. What's the point of being all imaginative in a therapy room when you close your eyes if it doesn't intersect with those everyday images? So it seems that the inner imagination definition is not quite fit for purpose. Um, so, how else are we going to understand it? And how else are we going to find out what it is if the dictionary is not going to help us? So I thought that rather than getting bogged down in our um, abstract analysis of various different definitions and therapy book wonky jargon type stuff, um, I thought we'd... Um, test out imagination tonight by being imaginative and then hopefully our definition will align and reflect that experiential ground of imagining and that's a really important point because the danger is in our highly rational culture is that we kind of bypass the direct experience of imagining and we get into ideas and explanations and theories about imagination and if we're not careful thinking about images which is really interesting and we're going to do some of that tonight I mean you need to think but the danger is that you kind of get seduced by that and you get a quick hit of understanding and you think you're imagining and you end up spending more time thinking about images than being imaginative as sometimes happens when you go to an art gallery and you spend more time looking at the little rectangular blurb beside the painting than looking at paintings. It's kind of like you look at the painting you know, and then you go to the blurb to find out and you get this little quick hit of understanding. You go, all oh, right, okay. It's a da 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 da. And then you move on to the next painting and you do the same again. But at least in an art gallery, there's no confusion about the distinction between blurb, text, and a painting, right? But when you go unconscious to your assumptions about imagination, you can end up forgetting that difference between your ideas about imagining, i.e. the blurb, and imagining, i.e. the paintings. 
and psychological concepts and ideas, they help us think about energies. So, for example, the idea of the inner child and its provenance in our, in our historical childhood, these are assumptions, ideas, blurb, about an actual encounter with an image of a child. That's the experience. This is the idea. And the danger is that these theories can quickly turn images into ideas. And that gives you a certain clarity, but it removes the richness and the complexity of that encounter with the image. And that's why art gallery blurb is not satisfying. And that's why if you go to an art gallery and you end up just reading more blurb than looking at paintings, you leave feeling like you've kind of missed out on something. Because you've not gone to the art gallery to look at blurb. You've gone to the art gallery to be moved by images. You want an emotional impact, and that's dependent on an interaction with the paintings, not the blurb. So what is this interaction? What is it that happens when we imagine? So, we are going to do what's called a phenomenological inquiry. Uh, and basically that means you attend to the phenomena, i.e. the experience, and you try and just get your ideas about the experience out of the way. So you just bracket your assumptions about it, and you try and just get as close as you can to the phenomena that you're trying to study. And this, this, is, our, this is our phenomena. So we've got a painting by Van Gogh, um, the guy who chopped off his ear. This is called the bedroom. Um, so we're going to refer to this through the talk and see what we can learn about imagining by just noticing what happens <coughs> as we look at the painting. So the first thing that happens for me as I look at the painting is that it's a bit boring and it doesn't immediately capture my attention. Uh, if it was on a phone or a computer I might scroll past or if I was in an art gallery I might end up reading the blurb. Okay. So I have to resist that and, and I keep looking at the painting. Okay. So there's a, a room, kind of wonky room, with two upright chairs, a wash stand, a narrow bed, a white towel hanging from a nail behind the door. <coughs> and it's a, really, it's a really spacious room. And it's a bit calming, and as I look at it, I notice my thoughts are beginning to slow down. And the bed has been neatly made up, and the covers folded over, and the pillows puffed up against the headboard. And I imagine the bed being made. I imagine a routine of tidiness, a care. And a cooling breeze trickles through the window, which is open just a crack. And the glass is opaque with a deep green light. And outside I hear the swish of lush foliage growing nearby. And above the bed are two portraits. One is a man and the other is a woman. And both of them are looking directly at me. And they seem a little nonplussed at my presence. And they're wondering what I am doing in their room. And at this point, I'm starting to feel a little bit uneasy. I feel like I've had enough. And I should probably move on before the occupant of the room comes back. So what is happening as we look at the painting? What is it that happens between us and the painting that brings the painting to life? So I've got three different aspects of imagining that we are going to uh, describe. 
each of which comes out of looking at the, the painting. And the first aspect is embodied imagination. Embodied imagination. Uh, so, a couple of quotes, because it's not just me that thinks this. Uh, so, Robert Bosnack, he's another young Ian. Um, he says, embodied imagination is a call to the senses. John, John Berger, the art critic, he says, every image embodies a way of seeing. So while the bed and the tables and the window and the painting and the Van Gogh are not present to the senses, they're not actually here with us, their appearance is nevertheless dependent on what is here with us, which is this piece of paper with ink on it. Okay? This printout is physically there. And yet the imagined painting is more than just ink. When we look at this, we don't just see brush strokes. We don't just see pixels. Um, something else is going on. And that something else is a process of imagination at work. Because basically, what imagination is doing is taking the raw sensory data and it's turned it into something beyond what it actually is. It's made something more of <coughs> painting than what it actually is. So, um, David Abram, he calls himself a cultural ecologist, he, he writes this, he says, that which we call imagination, <coughs> that which we call imagination is from the first an attribute of the senses themselves. Imagination is not a separate mental faculty, but is rather the way the senses themselves have of throwing themselves <coughs> beyond what is immediate, immediately given. The way the senses themselves have of throwing themselves beyond what is immediately given. So, what is immediately given is a flat piece of paper. What you imagine is three-dimensional space. What you imagine is a place. What you imagine is a room. But this isn't a room. Okay. Also, this uh, piece of paper, um, it's not going anywhere. It's completely static. But you imagine a timeline. So I imagine a breeze that has movement that's flowing past me. I imagine an immediate past in which someone has made the bed recently. I imagine an immediate future in which someone's going to come back. There's a sense of time. But the, but the painting is frozen in time. We imagine beyond what is given. And thirdly, this is a seemingly inert and inanimate object. And imagination has enlivened it. Um, it has a presence. Um, it's kind of alive. Um, we felt the presence of the person who is the occupant of the room, even though they're not even depicted. And the two portraits on the wall, they, 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 they took on a personhood. They had a personality. So in the same way that a cinema projector projects onto a blank screen and animates that blank screen and stationary screen, so too imagination transforms the flat, static and inert painting into a dynamic living place. And yet, so there is a projective element. You are projecting something into the painting, but it's not just about projection. The movie projector metaphor does not quite fit because the notion of projection fails to account for what it is about certain objects that call forth our imagination. 
So the movie projector image assumes that the world is a blank screen that we project onto, and all the images, all the projection comes from us. But obviously, life isn't a blank screen. Obviously, the painting isn't a blank screen. Obviously, the people in the world and the places and things in the world are not a blank screen. So in terms of the painting, um, Van Gogh's uh, choice of colours and shapes and his technique, that projects into us. It sends something into us. It evokes a certain mood and an atmosphere in us. So as I project into the painting, you can think about how the painting is also projecting into me. It's like a mutual projection. So um, R.D. Lang, the um, maverick Scottish psychiatrist, um, he says that imagination is neither entirely inner or outer. So this is what he says. He says, this distinction between outer and inner, it is a distinction between different modalities of experience, namely perception as somehow outer, in contrast to imagination, etc., as inner. But perception, imagination, reverie, dreams, memory, are simply different modalities of experience, none more inner or outer than any others. So hopefully we're beginning to see that a one-sidedly inner imagination is not matched by the phenomenological evidence the assumption of a strict divide between inner and outer breaks down because the process of imagination happens between us and the painting. The image isn't just in my mind, but neither is the image just in the painting. It arises between us and the painting, or between us and the world. So it's never quite possible to arrive at the objective image. There's always a subjective element. James Hillman again, he says, a purely objective stance is not possible. Experience is never raw or brute. It is always constructed by images. So what we perceive when we look at the painting arises from a co-creation. And that doesn't just happen in art galleries. That's happening all the time in our interactions with people, places and things. Imagination is, is, is the senses throwing themselves beyond what is immediately given to try and come up with a story, a picture, to understand the world. So basically, imagination is woven into perception. Everything that we see, think and feel is imbued with imagination. Philip Pullman, who's an ace guy, he's a writer, there's a line in his current book, it says, you won't understand anything about imagination until you realise that it's not about making things up, it's about perception. You won't understand anything about imagination until you realise that it's not about making things up, it's about perception. Now, when I get this far out into the territory, I begin to hear this voice calling me back. And it's the voice of the guy who wrote the dictionary. And he's like nagging at me. It's a he. And he's like, surely everything can't just be made up and imagined. Don't we need some kind of reality check? Isn't there a difference between fact and fiction? These are important questions, okay? And we need to deal with them. So let's sort let's sort these questions out. Um, so just because imagination is woven into perception, that doesn't mean that all our imaginings are equally valid. Um, while perhaps we all see a slightly different Van Gogh. And that doesn't really matter, because it's just a painting. 
the images that we uh, perceive, how we imagine ourselves, how we imagine other people in the world, that does matter. So in psychotherapy, um, how a client projects onto the therapist is called transference. So they transfer an image onto the therapist. They project this image onto the therapist. And if the client imagines that their therapist is like a grumpy therapist, an unsupportive therapist, a critical therapist, a forgetful therapist, then that's, that matters because that's going to get in the way of them trusting the therapist and, and the therapeutic journey will be interrupted. Now, if that therapist, and I'm open to this, is indeed a grumpy therapist then that is an accurate imagining. The client has it right. Their image of the therapist is aligned with the evidence of their embodied sensual experience. However, if the therapist is doing their damnedest to empathise and continually express an interest and care for this client and the client nevertheless continues to perceive them negatively then their image of the therapist is what we could call a disembodied fantasy imagining a disembodied fantasy imagining fantasy so I got a description of that from Bosnak who we met earlier so fantasy is a mental process akin to rational thinking an indirect, disembodied feeling of distance and a controlling, grasping attitude of habitual consciousness. The endless reconfirmation of pre-existing notions. Erecting a wall against the fresh. So fantasy life of disembodied imagining is, um, is when you project a, a wonky, goofy, out-of-date belief system onto the world. So say you did have a critical parent and you grew up with that person and that kind of like shapes who you are and then you go through life s repeatingly seeing this critical person despite the evidence as happens in that negative transference example then you're kind of trapped in a, in a fantasy life that despite the evidence continues to see things um, in a particular way. So only to the extent that we attend to the evidence of our senses can our imagination align with the objective pole of experience. Fantasy is when you don't balance out the subjective pole of experience with the objective pole and you kind of, there's nothing to um, uh, check it or balance it out uh, and you get lost in a fantasy. That's the problem with fantasy. It isn't embodied. It's an inner world. James Hillman again. The moment you leave sensing out of imagining, it is imagining that becomes an inferior function. Sheer fantasy, mere imaginings, only a dream. <coughs> Unfortunately, that's really, really common. Um, disembodied fantasy is very common and it's so common it's even the dictionary definition for imagination images in the mind not present to sense experience but this is only the rump imagining that's left after the loss of sensory aliveness why is it common? well because you get rammed into a little desk in a big classroom for hours and hours every day and you get taught how to think and you don't get a lot of help on how to feel and because you're rammed into a desk you end up leaving your body and you lose your sensing aliveness and then you grow up and what do you do? You live in alienating environments and you have an alienating lifestyle you sit on the underground all day and it's, it's very hard not to deaden our embodiment and that takes imagining out of the world. So one of the things that we can do to 
recover our imagining, to enhance our imaginative lives, is to recover our ability to notice and participate in our surroundings, to attend to the details of our lives. Whether that's the gaze of a therapist or the swoop of an osprey, that's the way back to that story-filled, lost imagination that we may have had in our early life. So that's the first aspect of imagining, embodied imagining. So let's go back to where we left off the, the waking dream exercise in the meadow. We're not done with that yet. There's a few more problems to come out of that one. So, um, so therapists, so I've been thinking about the inner imagination um, and, and then I come back and I hear the, 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 the trainer's voice and she says, allow the details of the meadow to appear. Notice the details, the sunlight, the breeze. Feel the ground beneath your feet. Feel the breeze. Feel the sunlight on your face. Listen for any sounds. Smell the air. Reach out and touch something. And I tried. I really tried. I really tried to see what it felt like to be in the middle. And the ground was slippery looking. But beneath my feet, I felt carpet. And the fast moving clouds that I think I saw, and sort of saw, they had an airy bluster about them. But all I heard was the sirens outside. And the buses coming to stop at the traffic lights. And the trampled grasses and weeds, they didn't smell. And I wasn't able to reach out and touch them. And if I felt anything, it was a sense of disappointment because I was so excited and hopeful about this exercise. The meadow felt concocted, a figment of imagination, imaginary, made up, not real. And somehow I was holding back. But I didn't understand why and I didn't understand what to do differently. So let's switch back to our painting. <laughs> see what we can learn here about that problem because in a similar way to the meadow exercise when I initially um, look at the Van Gogh I'm a bit bored I'm a bit restless it doesn't immediately capture my attention it, it felt separate from me but as I stuck with it I became interested and the sense of separation receded and I felt myself kind of drawn into the bedroom and it became not just a painting, not just an image on a piece of paper it turned into a place and a place that evoked a felt response in me and I kind of felt the cooling breeze and I enjoyed the spacious furnishings and I even began to worry about the, the absent occupant's return. So it's like I was no longer looking on from outside as if it was just a painting on the wall. It was as if I was actually there, somehow inside the painting. Not that I'd completely like forgotten my surroundings. I'm still aware of being here with you guys. But that can recede to the edges a little bit and it's kind of like I'm here but I'm also in the painting and it's this sense of occupying an encompassing image environment that is the second aspect of imagining and that's the immersive aspect of imagining so to imagine is immersive it's to find ourselves within and surrounded by an image. Because while imagining arises between me and the painting, that's not to suggest that there's kind of two different images, the one in my mind and the one that's real, the painting. The imagined image is ne neither of those. The imagined image is something between me and the painting. It's not inner or outer, it's not subjective or objective. 
it's not real or unreal, those categories don't really work because they're dualistic categories. The actual phenomenology of imagining doesn't fit into that way of thinking. The phenomena of imagination is to be surrounded by images, not peering in at them like on the smartphone through the screen or like an animal in the zoo. It's like you're, you're there in an imaginal landscape with images. So it's, rather than going to the zoo, it's more like going to, on a safari where you're up close to the animal, up close and in contact with images. So despite what the dictionary says, imagination seems to not be inside us. It is we that are inside imagination. So we're getting even further right now into this territory of the phenomena of imagining. And again, I can hear the dictionary guy. He's not giving up on me. He's not, he's not happy. And this is what he's saying now. He's saying, that's all well and good in art galleries, but surely you're not suggesting that we wander around in this dreamy way all the time. Isn't that a narcissistic self-absorption? Don't we need to learn to stand back and see what is really there. So he's really hanging on to this kind of like old world view of like real and unreal, inner and outer, um, as if that's an easy distinction to make. But let's deal with those questions. Uh, and to do that, we need to go back again to our discussion about fantasy versus imagination. So. Okay, so to look at a painting on, in an art gallery does invite, at least initially, a certain self-consciousness of imagining. It pushes us initially into a separation and a distance from the painting. But in normal everyday life, usually, most of the time, that's not what happens. You walk down the street and you don't perceive the world around you as if it's a painting on a gallery wall. You're just immersed in your surroundings. You're inhabiting the world. Until, that is, something out of the ordinary impinges your attention. So let's just say a weird, out-of-place shape and colour further down the street catches your eye. Something that you can't quite make out. Something that you don't have a word for. And that knocks you out of the immersion of your imagining. Okay? In the same way that happens when you go to an art gallery. So the process of imagining has become self-conscious. And you can, in those moments, which you might have had, you know what I'm talking about, you can see imagination wriggling around, trying to understand what it is. And as you walk closer to the the strange shape, imagination's coming up with uh, fantasies. So is it a rough sleeper's tent? Is it a police crime scene? Is it some kind of alien spacecraft that's crashed on Tooley Street? I don't know, but I need to find out. And eventually, of course, you get close enough and you realise it's just an outsized fluorescent shopping bag caught up in the railings and flapping in the breeze. And the evidence of your senses, uh, you've filled in the gaps in, in your sense experience by getting closer, and that's allowed you to have an accurate image of what's there. And then once you've done that, the immersion returns again. And you're in this surrounding image environment. And, 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 you, and you walk on. And so to answer the concerns about a self-absorbed fantasy, Immersive imagining is not wrong. It's just the way things are. We live in a surrounding world that we're immersed in. But again, that's not to say that all immersive imaginings are equally valid. The important thing, it seems to me, is to have an imaginative malleability and the confidence to allow or even seek out these interruptions to the immersion of our imagining. And to the extent that we have that imaginative malleability and we perhaps seek it 
without these interruptions, then we're not living in a fantasy. Because it's in the interruption of our immersive imagining and then the return of it with a more accurate imagining. That's how we grow. That's how you develop. That's how you evolve. That's how you change. You open yourself up to new evidence. You let go of an old way of imagining yourself in the world and you risk contact with new experience, with fresh experience and you learn to see what is there, you learn to see differently and that's not easy, it's a little bit stressful because for a little while in the middle you don't really know who you are you've you've stepped away from your old way of seeing the world Um, but if you can negotiate your way through that that's a movement towards psychological health, that's a movement towards insight, that's a movement towards enlightenment any activity that requires an embodied experience and an attending to that embodied experience of the surrounding world will tend towards immersive imagining so art galleries but probably cinema is an easier one so when you forget the artifice of projector and screen and, and, and the cinema seats and the popcorn munching kind of recede to the edge of your awareness and you get carried away and drawn into and transported by the movie and it's kind of like you're because it's just a flat screen right it's just some lights but you feel like you're there okay and that's immersive imagining and maybe through entering into the life of those characters and journeying with them for a while and feeling what they feel thinking what they think that takes you out of yourself that, 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 that allows you to experience a wider range of being um, that maybe you didn't have before and then you leave the cinema and you feel better you're not as depressed as when you went in you're a little bit more alive and you've been moved, you've been transformed by the images you don't know why you can not tell anyone why <coughs> nevertheless that doesn't matter you've been transformed by immersive imagining and the same thing happens when you go for a walk in the countryside the same thing can happen in therapy that's what therapy is about um, and the same thing can happen in a waking dream in a meadow between the dreamer and the dream landscape and these are not fantasies These are real and meaningful moments. They expand our horizons. And far from being a self-absorbed fantasy, it's an antidote to the individualism and the fragmentation and alienation of modern life. So the important point to take away is that fantasy is not a black and white issue. It's a matter of degree. There's always a finer grained image that we can imagine. And what matters is that we uh, learn to acknowledge that and work with that process. And essentially what that is, is an image-centric approach to psychotherapy or psychological health. Psychological suffering comes from holding on to old, outdated images that are no longer in alignment with what is. And it takes a lot of energy and pain to hold on to that because it's not supported by the world. You have to generate it anew all the time. So if we go back to the meadow exercise, we can kind of understand why it didn't really feel like I was there, why it felt kind of concocted. Because I would kind of imported the impoverished imagining from my everyday life into the waking dream and that's the problem with these exercises it expects us to suddenly just like be imaginative Um, but if in your everyday life you are like I was walking down to the street yeah there's clouds in the sky but I'm not really paying attention to the clouds Uh, yeah it's not cold, it's not hot but I'm I'm not really paying attention to the temperature I'm not really paying attention to the breeze Um, I'm kind of living in my head basically I'm a bit disembodied 
I'm not attending to the evidence of my senses. So then when you ask me to do a waking dream exercise or any other kind of imaginative uh, technique, um, the same thing happens. I'm not really present to the images. I don't really feel like I'm there with them. What you end up with is a hypothetical, abstract, meadow, breeze, sunlight. You end up with an idea of what it's like to be in a meadow. Nevertheless, the teacher, she carried on regardless. She didn't know anything about this. And she's getting very interested now. She says, a bus approaches along a road running through the meadow. Okay. Imagine road suddenly. Imagine bus. What kind of bus? Does it matter? Can a red bus be okay? So I quickly created all this. And now it really felt like I was making it up. Um, and then the teacher says, the bus comes to a halt nearby. Two or three characters get off the bus. You observe them. This is what the teacher says. These are the instructions. You notice their age, you notice how they're dressed, and you notice how they move. A small boy in school uniform, shorts and blazer, with white shirt and striped tie, got off the bus and stood in front of the wheel of the bus, kicking the tyre with his heel. A couple of adults got off and they wandered away into the meadow nearby. They were arguing with each other. But the main thing that caught my attention was this little boy. He's standing there by the wheel, which is about the same size as him. <coughs> the teacher says, decide which character stands out to you the most and spend some time with it. And the schoolboy, he glanced over at me and then away again, just quick. And then his fingers absentmindedly started playing with the straps of his uh, leather uh, school bag and this is starting to feel real, this is starting to feel alive this doesn't feel manufactured this little person, I'm not making this up he feels like he's there and then he moves and he wanders down the side of the bus and he sits on the running board at the back and then the teacher says consider what you might like to say to this character so I was like, hello um, and he didn't even look up. That was really disappointing. I wanted him to say hello back. Uh, he just sat there on the back step and he's flipping his satchel open and he's flipping it shut. It's like he's not even heard me. I'm just getting blanked by this schoolboy. So I'm like, hello! And now he starts pulling all the stuff out of his satchel and he's got jotters and he's got pencils, textbooks, lunchbox. Teacher carries on regardless. Enter into conversation with this character and find out what it wants from you. Find out what it needs from you. So I'm feeling like, oh shit, I'm sure everyone else is really good at this and they're racing ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, oh come on, I'm not that bad. He's still not saying anything to me. Which is really weird because in normal everyday life, usually I can talk to people and usually they hear me and usually they talk back. And the teacher had suggested that I chat to this <coughs> character as if it was just like easy, like normal. Um, so I'm thinking, I must be doing something wrong. So why was I finding that so difficult? So let's go back to our painting. So this is the third aspect of imagining. So we've had embodied imagining, we've had immersive imagining, this is number three. Um, and we can see it in the painting. Um, the, pa the painting is populated by characters. Even though this particular painting ostensibly shows a room with no human figures in it, Imagination, nevertheless, can't help itself and filled it with living presences. So the main character was the occupant of the room. Not seen, but nevertheless imagined. The person who had recently folded the covers of the bed, puffed up the pillows, 
the person who could return at any time and finds me in his room, those in about. Similarly, you've got the portraits on the wall. They came alive and they're staring right at me and, and I feel a bit uneasy being looked at by them. They seem irritated that I'm there. And they seem, when I'm imagining and embodied and immersed in the painting, they seem just like any actual person in everyday life. And that's and it's this spontaneous presentation of images as human-like presences that characterizes this third aspect, which I call the animistic aspect of imagining. So what's animism? So animism is the attribution of human-like qualities, like intelligence, purpose, consciousness, to seemingly non-human and inanimate things, objects. So David Abraham, we've met him already, so he says, direct pre-reflective perception is inherently animistic, disclosing the things and elements that surround us, not as inert objects, but as expressive subjects, entities, powers, potencies. So for example, the people that we meet in our dreams, in dreamscape, when you remember back because the dream, they, you, 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 you treated them just like you would normal everyday people, right? You didn't think, oh, this is dream character, unless you were in a lucid dream, which is unusual. Um, similarly, when you're uh, watching a movie, like we were talking about earlier, or, or you're getting into a really good novel, the characters in the story seem to take on a life of their own. Um, they, they have a reality to them. You feel for them, you want to be with them, you're sad when the story comes to an end and they leave your life. Even when you're not reading the novel, it's kind of like they might follow you around. It's like they're with you. Um, and then obviously memories, which is imagining to the people from our past, they have a, 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 a living presence. Um, you know, people that have died, they can feel like they're with us sometimes um, in imagination. And this is a well recognized aspect of imagina imagining. So, Roberto Sagioli from Psychosynthesis, he writes of um, semi autonomous characters of imagination called subpersonalities. He doesn't quite go the whole way because I'm semi autonomous. Robert Bosnak who was writing quite a bit after Sagittarius, he goes the whole way, and he talks about these characters of imagination as fully autonomous, <coughs> others with independent lives. Um, James Hillman, he talks about these characters as animistic, but he uses the word personifying um, because of the dodgy roots of animism in like early anthropology. Uh, which kind of like was which perceived indigenous people as like primitives. Uh, so he, 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 he acknowledges animism, but he doesn't use it. But these days, animism is having a bit of a renaissance. And there's a school of thought called new animism. And they've remo removed it from the distortions of the colonial origins of the term. And it's a critical term that's getting applied in discussions and thinking around consciousness and ethics and ecology. Um, so it's in that spirit that I'm sort of bringing it in here to our discussion of imagination. So like we're rehabilitating, rehabilitating the term animism to help us clarify and align our understanding of imagination. So, again, the dictionary guy, he's not giving up. Isn't this animism just a weird anthropomorphism? A tinkering about with a primitive belief system you know nothing about. Just a childish embarrassment, but quite possibly a dangerous flirting with your sanity. 
Uh, and it can feel a little bit um, risky uh, to move into this animistic territory. It's, it, you can feel a little bit worrisome to grab <coughs> images and autonomy. They're not my images. They're not making me up. They're images. They're living presences. They have an independence. It goes against what we've learned to be true and scientific. It goes against our modern world view. But the patina of modernity is wafer thin. It's like the scum on the surface of the pond. If we scratch it, if we go through that thin, thin layer, which has only really been built up over the last 200 years, what we find is animism all over the frickin' place. We are animists. We can't really help ourselves. Um, it's just neglected. It's just not called that. We just take it for granted. So, for example, in our speech, um, life is cheating us, um, inflation is eating up our profits, and the experiment gave birth to a new theory. So, shot through all our metaphorical language, we attribute um, a life to things to processes, to objects um, that, that are seemingly inanimate. And then you can see animism in, um, you know, when your computer crashes and you talk to your computer in that voice that you have and you get frustrated with it or you curse it um, or maybe you, you get a new smartphone and you don't understand it and you, and you, you feel sad and you feel the absence of your old smartphone. So that's, that's, that's animism. You, you, you've attributed the machine uh, with the personality. Um, but the main place where we see animism, and we do it every day a lot, is in reading. So as we scan our eyes across the text, David Abraham says, the inert letters, <coughs> inert inverted commas, letters on the page now speak to us, a form of animism that we take for granted, but is animism nonetheless as mysterious as a talking stone. So just as a process of imagining happened between me and the painting, a process of imagining happens between us and the text, because the text is just paper and ink, just like the painting. Um, but what happens when we scan our eyes over it? We see, we imagine scenes, we hear imagined voices, we enter into imagined lives. And um, I like to trace that back to memories of learning to read at school and going up to the teacher's desk. And you'd go up to the teacher's desk one at a time. Everyone else would be playing with their Play-Doh or whatever. And, and, and you'd go there and you'd painstakingly go, see... No, you see, what's C? K, A, T, and then you go, cat, and then there'd be this like moment of revelation where the image of a cat would appear, and and it was kind of like the book had spoken to me, and how I like to remember that is that wasn't a big deal in a way because other things spoke to me all the time, like dolls and puppies and trains and flags, um same thing happens. You spend time, because you're much more embodied as a kid, right? And you're much more immersed in that essential world. You're up close to blankets, you smell things, and, and they talk to you, and you talk to them, and, and they, they feel like they're alive. Theodore Rozak, he's an eco-psychologist. He, he's, he's got this great idea. He thinks this childhood animism is a psychic inheritance from our hunter-gatherer ancestors. He talks about an innate animism regenerated anew by each generation, as if it were a gift in a newborn's enchanted sense of the world. So it's kind of like while we're no longer living in the Stone Age, culture and technology has moved on, biologically, in our DNA, in our imagination, we're still living in the Stone Age. And that's why when children come in, into the world, they don't, um, they don't rock up like 
knowing how to computer code in an office, they rock up just instinctively in their bones, knowing how to cross the species barrier and talk to plastic dolls. They just do. It's, it's, and, 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 and that's not any different to a talking stone. Um, but it doesn't last. It doesn't last. <coughs> Sooner or later we are taught to doubt rather than build upon this childhood imagining. And the sensual immersion of the outdoors is replaced with the classroom. And our gaze is directed away from the world towards books, calculators, TV screens. And we learn to read, and that involves a break with, Abraham says, the spontaneous participation of our eyes and ears in the surrounding terrain in order to recouple our senses upon the flat surface of the page. So it's kind of like we have to break the animism away from the world and we specialise it in reading and the animating the magic is slowly withdrawn from the world and confined to the technology of the written word Rozak suggests that that requires a repression it requires a wrenching effort and a painful one to maintain and we call that pain neurosis so what he's suggesting is that the loss of our imaginative ability is not just a neutral loss. It comes with a cost. It leaves us with a sense of pain and a grief and perhaps a dim sense that we've lost something important. Not that we exactly know what it is. Because the common sense idea of imagination is an amnesia. It's kind of like we've forgotten what we've forgotten. And what we need is a more accurate definition of imagination. So let's, we're nearly there, so let's pull, pull it together. So we've got embodied imagining, immersive imagining, and animistic imagining. Let's try and come up with a better definition than the inner imagination. Before we do that, very briefly... The inner imagination comes from the origins of psychology. So Freud and those guys, late 19th, early 20th century, they were all trained up as medical doctors. That means they were trained in the medical method, the empirical method. Empiricism is an approach that tries to separate out the observer, the scientist, and so that he, can, he or she can... Um, accurately observe the objects in the world. So empiricism divides the world up into subjects, which is dodgy, and objects. And we want to measure the objective world as clearly as possible. And that was the orthodoxy at the time when psychology was a new and emerging discipline. So it was the orthodoxy, and, and also because most of these psychologists had been trained in the empirical method, it was no surprise, kind of inevitable, that psychology first presented itself to the world as an inner empiricism. They wanted to legitimate themselves as a proper science. So basically they sort of inverted empirical observation of the world, and they thought of psychology as an observation of inner objects. So images, but also feelings, thoughts, all psychological experience were thought of as inner objects that we could observe, measure, understand, manipulate. Hence, the inner imagination. But that's, as we've seen, an oversimplification. Simplification. That's not what the phenomena, phenomena, phenomena of imagination is. What we need is a theoretical ground that validates that full experience of imagination. And we have the advantage today that Freud didn't have because no longer is the orthodoxy empiricism. So you, you've, you've, had, um, you've had all the, the, the sciences. You've got relativity, quantum, complexity science. They've overturned these one-time certainties of an uh, empirical world. 
And while it's slow to change our common sense reality and dictionary definitions, nevertheless that allows us to think outside that box. And contemporary psychotherapy has long since moved on from that intrapsychic one-person psychology. And we can draw upon the work of psychotherapists exploring an imagination that goes beyond the limitations <coughs> of an inner understanding. So I've just pulled together a few strands that I'm going to try and weave together to come up with something of a new definition for imagination. So, uh, Robert Romanison, he's a youngin, he says, Between subject and object, a story appears, which is expressed in a way of seeing and speaking about the world. The story which appears is the appearance of psychological life. Okay? Donald Kalshed, another young Ian, he says very similarly, By the reality of the psyche, I mean an intermediate realm of experience which serves as a ligament connecting the inner self and the outer world by, which, by means of a symbolic process which communicates a sense of meaning. These guys are talking about psychological in the same way as we've been talking about imagination. Between subject and object, an intermediate realm of experience, psychological life is a story, a symbolic meaning. The psychological is imaginal and vice versa. Carl Jung says it even more emphatically. He says psyche is image. Psyche is image. He says that every psychic process is an image and imagining. And psyche is the translation, is translated into English as soul. Psyche is translated into English as soul. And what do we mean by soul? James Hillman writes, By soul, I mean the imaginative possibility in our natures, the experiencing through reflective speculation, dream, image, and fantasy, that mode which recognizes all realities as primarily symbolic or metaphorical. Another definition of soul, between us and events, between the doer and the deed, there is a reflective moment, and soul making means differentiating this middle ground. Soul is imagination. Soulfulness is to be imaginative. And there's a link there to transpersonal psychology, because Roberto Sagioli, he spoke about psychosynthesis and transpersonal psychology as putting the soul back into psychology. And you can see that in the root meaning of transpersonal. Um, trans. Trans is usually translated as beyond. So transpersonal psychology is a psychology beyond the person. But more fully, it also means across, through, pervading, so as to change, transform. So a transpersonal psychology is one that includes the personal me, pervading, yet also moves across and through this me in an active fashion, seeking to transform. It's a psychology that acknowledges and explores a sense of connection to something more than our individual self. So it's a psychology that attends to and is interested in those moments that blur the divide between us and the world. So gazing at a sunset or walking through a forest or a really good conversation or a really transformative therapy session, these are moments that blur our sense of separation and take us into connection. These are transpersonal experiences. So, as should hopefully be coming clear by now, the embodied, immersive and animistic aspects of imagining are not passive, they are not an inner experience, 
they're an active participation. It's, they are the way the senses themselves have of throwing themselves beyond what is immediately given. They are a transpersonal experience. A couple of other things. Sajuli writes about the synthetic function of imagination. So he talks about how imagination synthesizes and brings together the disparate elements of our psyche into a complex whole. Imagination is a function which in itself is to some extent synthetic, since imagination can operate at several levels concurrently, those of sensation, feeling, thinking, intuition. In other words, imagination isn't really a faculty. You don't really see it on its own. You see it through the other faculties. You never quite catch it operating on, it on, on its own because it works through and behind and within and upon and below these other faculties. It is transpersonal. It cuts across. It moves through. It moves beyond. So, basically, I've, I've, I've not got an actual definition because it's quite hard to come up with a new definition, but what I'm pointing towards, it's a kind of work in process, what I'm pointing towards is that an inner imagination is akin to a personal imagination, an isolated, contained and limited imagination. And what I'm pointing to, on the other hand, is that the actual phenomenology of imagining that I have described might be what we call a transpersonal imagination, an open, connected, participatory imagination. And I think we should probably leave it there. Okay, thank you. <laughs>